Aloha. It's July the 13th, 2022. Give me only one thing. It's time for American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And today's title is Connect the Dots, Hate Groups in the Trump White House. Yesterday, we had our, um, I think, seventh installment of the January 6th House Select Committee hearings. And uh, not to be disappointed, but there was new information that we just didn't really quite know or understand. And what the um, major points of the hearing were, the, the takeouts that I, I came up with was the big uh, insane crazy meeting on December the 18th, which took place with a cast of characters known as Team Crazy. The cast of characters included Rudy Giuliani, General Michael Flynn, Attorney Sidney Powell for Donald Trump, Rudy Giuliani, Mark Meadows, and the Overstock CEO, Patrick Byrne. And for Team Normal, we had Pat Cipollone, White House attorney, and Eric Hersherman, another attorney for the White House. So that's the cast. Of, that's the cast. And we're going to discuss exactly what that meeting was all about and a lot more. So before I go on, I'd like to introduce my special guest and co-host, Jay Fidel, and always special guest, Cynthia Lee Sinclair. Good morning. Morning, Tim. Morning, Cynthia. Oh, it was fun listening to the hearings uh, and the recap of the hearings. Boy, oh boy, did we learn things that we never knew before and uh, not to be disappointed. So Jay, um, you know, here we have the big takeouts from that January uh, 18th meeting that uh, kind of was unannounced and Sidney Powell and uh, Michael Flynn just kind of waltzed into the Oval Office. Must be nice to just waltz into the Oval Office and see the President of the United States without an appointment, but that's what they did. And uh, what we came out with it is that uh, they advised Donald Trump to seize all the election machines in various states to get the United States military to go pick them up and seize them. In addition to that, we had um, a request from Sidney Powell to appoint her as special counsel to basically uh, jail anybody who got in the way of the, the confiscation of election machines. Isn't that special? What was, what was your take out of the, of the hearings yesterday? What, what, stuck, what stood out for you? Well, first, I think the meeting you're talking about was December 18th. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, uh, running overnight till nearly two o'clock in the morning on December 19th. That is um, after the election and before the insurrection, right? Right in that period. Part of, part of the galvanization of Trump's uh, insurrection crowd. So my take on the hearing, I mean, I, you said it, it was a big surprise. To, it wasn't a big surprise to me. Uh, I've been thinking about what happened, uh, him watching, watching television and doing nothing, despite the protestations of the people around him on January 6th. We kind of knew his attitude. We know uh, what a wild man he is, not to use the word wild too much. Um, and, uh, and you could have imagined this kind of thing happening. Um, it's the inmates running the asylum. And you know, what is suggests to me, Tim and Cynthia, is that this is not um, a phenomenon limited to the insurrection. This is the way the White House worked. He brought people or allowed people in to see him. And the crazier they were, the more inviting he was. And by letting him come into the Oval Office, he was you know, essentially saying, I accept you. I believe in you. I agree with you. I want to hear from you. I want you to advise me. But I think his whole administration was like that. You know, we, we, we have thought for the last couple of hundred years that the people who visited the Oval Office were rational, but not in the Trump administration. This was an example of gross irrationality, uh, the inmates running the asylum. And, and so it's, to me, it's not really that much of a surprise what happened. That's, but, a, that's, uh, that's a good point. Isn't it true he selects people that think like himself? And and just wants yes yes men lackeys. Uh, that's who he really wants around him to surround him. To totally agree with whatever he says and thinks. Well, I think yes, but there's a dynamic here. There's a trend um, that uh, he wanted crazier crazier people all the time, and he got crazier people all the time. It was getting worse and worse, and this was you know the apex of all of that. It was really bad because his own appointees, his own lawyer appointees. What was it, uh, Hirschman and Cipollone? Um, they were on the conserv 
I should say the reasonable side of things, saying no, don't team normal. That. You know, <laughs> act normal, don't do this. Um, and Trump, Trump really wasn't listening to them very much and spent until two in the morning listening to, you know, the inmates. So um, I think this was an example of when the two sides parted ways right there in front of him. You could imagine that meeting. And I would say this too, you know, what we heard in the hearings um, about the Proud Boys and all that, the Oath Keepers, this is, this is downplayed. You know, they're not telling us the real shtum and the drawn of what happened. But the same thing with that meeting on December 18th. They're not telling us how really crazy it was. Re remember uh, Cassidy, who said there was ketchup on the wall. You know, they were throwing things at each other. Trump was having a mental breakdown in front of all of them. Um, you know, and Sidney Powell was, I think, largely responsible for his decompensation. So, yes, we got a pretty interesting story. Uh, no, I don't think it was a big surprise, especially after Cassidy. But, you know, in view of all we've seen, all the dots we've connected over the past five years on this very show, Tim. Um, but, you know, I think, I think also it's understated. And um, it, it demonstrates the, uh, his state of mind that nobody was going to convince him all otherwise. Right. All right. That's the, that's the critical phrase right there, Jay. I think you just hit it. And that is the state of mind. Because up to now, they've been saying, well, you know, Donald Trump wasn't really all that involved. And it was all his henchmen that were you know, scheming, plotting, and planning, be it at the hotel or wherever. Uh, and Donald Trump was just kind of an ancillary player in all this, not really up to snuff to what was going on. But I think Liz Cheney has said it correctly, and that is, what is his state of mind? Uh, you, you, you know, just to go back a little bit, you just the first, when Bill Barr says to Trump, there is no evidence of a fraud election. That's when Trump went unhinged through the plate, Tomatoes, ketchup, whatever it is, against the wall, just went unhinged against Bill Barr. So there's a, there's a point of state of mind. He's being told over and over and over by attorneys left and right that there is no fraud in this, Mr. President. And then, of course, you have acting deputy um, attorney general for the Department of Justice, Donahue, who also says uh, th these results aren't correct. They're wildly incorrect. There is no fraud in these elections. And that's when he just says, remember to the DOJ, hey, don't just say, just go along with it. Just say this, we'll handle the rest and the Republicans will handle the rest. This day there's issues enough for the states to be alarmed about a potential fraud in the election. And that was his influence on the DOJ. And then last but not least, you know, again, we have um, all the things that uh, Cipollone has been telling Trump all along in these meetings that no, there's no fraud. So before he does the magical tweet on December the... It was the 19th. 19th. It thank was you. the morning. Thank you, the yeah. morning after the yeah, meeting. and it was that that all tell 142. Yeah, 142 a.m. Uh, tweet saying, you know, statistically it's impossible for me to lose this election. Come to Washington D.C. on January the sixth. Be there. It will be wild. So as a result, um, that says his state of mind was is convinced that no matter what he's told, he's going to try to disrupt the uh, the election process and certainly Mike Pence's role in that process. Uh, to your point. To your point of state of mind, did Donald Trump have state of mind, in your opinion, well right. into advance? The people around him had suggested, you know, we, we can remember a number of them uh, had suggested the 25th Amendment. That was not a lighthearted touch. Um, they really felt he'd lost it. And indeed, if you remember Kellyanne Conway in the, in the campaign of 2016, um, you know, with alternative facts and, and, and then Trump I mean, rolling out 30,000 lies. I mean, how can you tell when he's lying? His lips are moving. That sort of thing. You know, this is really pathological. And so what we have here is a president who increasingly lied. Worse yet, he lied to himself. This is a president who was unhinged many times and who had his own reality. He lived in, in, in a world of, of pathological, if not insanity. And so, you know, what I'm saying is this is the natural progression of 30,000 lies. He's lying to himself. He's lying to the people. He's lying to the people around him and his staff and in, in the Oval Office. Um, so I think that's what comes out. And when, when she raises, when, when Liz Cheney raises this notion of state of, state of mind, and when we talk about it here on Think Tech, um, we're talking about a guy who was nuts. Um, and, he, you know, uh, that's the long and short of it. 
Now, the question, ultimately, I know you're going to get to this. The question is, um, what, what do the people out there believe? Because they are hearing at least some of this. And they're hearing witness after witness talk about his, you know, being unhinged, un unable to wrap his mind around the reality, the truth. Um, and it, it sort of, it reinforces the rumors and uh, the, the uh, reports that they have denied over the past four years that he's a liar. Um, they have gone along with him. But this may cause at least some of the people in his base and to say, wait a minute, he was really disconnected with the reality. And this is an example. Um, nobody gets involved in a ridiculous meeting like this. Good points. All great points, Jay. Cynthia, I am going to ask that question. What effect is this having on Americans? I know that um, Liz Cheney has done an excellent job of trying to leave breadcrumbs for the Department of Justice to say, hey, look at this or look at that. Um, that may not be the role of the hearing committee, but she's doing an excellent job. But some of her points, particularly regarding Trump's state of mind, may not be fully paid attention to by the Department of Justice. But she is, I think, winning points to the American public, particularly those who want to really entertain that Donald Trump was any, uh, had any involvement in this. Uh, to Jay's question, which I'd like to ask you is, is she making points with that population of audience? Well, I don't know as I think he was crazy. More like crazy like the fox. He's, you know, we talk about him being really dumb and he is in so many normal ways, but he's brilliant con man. And so all of this, you know, crazy making behavior, well, it's easy to say, well, he was crazy. He wasn't crazy. He knew exactly what he was doing. And I think he did it on purpose and he planned it out. And all the people that we like to call team crazy, yes, to a normal person, they're crazy. The kind of stuff they were coming up with was not so, but not really if you look at it from the point of view of, did they want to get their own outcome? And did they want to manipulate what that outcome would be? And so that, to mm -hmm. us, that looks crazy. To them, it's just corrupt and, and, and evil because it is. It's darkness, it's lies, it's untruth. And, and so I don't know as I like to, to have that label on him as being crazy because then we can dismiss everything as crazy. And, well, and I don't think we yeah, should. Yeah, I mean, even, guilt, even crazy people do serve time. Yeah. Uh, they, and they do get convicted. So, did, you know, at the beginning of the hearing, Liz Cheney kind of uh, had a nice introduction to say that, and I'll paraphrase some of this, is that, you know, Donald Trump really is in the center of this attack. He wasn't just an ancillary off to the side kind of uh, role play here. Uh, he was in the center of it. And she, she said, you know, here's a 76 year old man, not not an impressionable child who has access to the most detail of this whole process, uh, detail about the election results, detail about how, you know, how things came about in each and every state. And uh, over and over again, he was told by his attorneys and those that were not team crazy that you have lost. The president of the United States is going to Joe Biden. And he had that knowledge over and over again. And the question is, as she put very properly, is. How can you willfully ignore or the, say um, willfully be ignorant of these things? And that doesn't work. Did she do a good job in, in, in that yesterday and previous hearings? Have they done a fairly a sufficient job to put Donald Trump in the center of the, all this pre-planning of the insurrection of the Capitol? I, I really think that they've done a great job of that. And um, they, it seems like they center all of the in stuff that they bring forward around Trump. And I love that they're using Republicans, staunch Republicans that are the ones that are coming forward saying, you know, I love my Republican party, but I'm not gonna break the law for them. There was a, um, a really great interview, I mean, uh, uh, article on in the Washington Post today that um, the ex cultists deliver the most effective message for Republicans, and it was as if they were saying, "Hey, it's okay to make a mistake. You can change your mind. You can wake up and and realize that you were following a lie, and you can turn from it." And I thought that was really important 
And I think one of the things that struck me the most emotionally out of all of it was the way that I can't remember which um, it was the, the short haired guy, not the guy with all the tattoos mm -hmm. and the jean jacket. Can't remember either one of their names. I'm sorry. But um, the, the guy with the shorter red hair, he profoundly and genuinely apologized to every single policeman as he walked, every single Capitol policeman as he walked by at the end of the hearing. And that, I, that was important to me to see how really remorseful this guy was, you know, as he's realizing what a terrible thing he did to them. And I thought that was powerful. And I don't know if anybody mm -hmm. else saw it. Well, ha ha yes, that was in the newspaper. But um, the question is whether he's been sentenced yet and whether he was trying to garner favor with the sentencing authority. I didn't think about that. Well, if that's true, uh, he did pretty well. He might get some favor, favor of treatment. Um, you know, what you saw is an act of, uh, of reconciliation or attempt to reconcile his uh, grievous sins. Mm -hmm. And um, man, I, I thought it was very poignant too, but that doesn't mean he's not gonna serve time. But you're right, Jay, maybe he'll serve less time. Good point. Right. So, well, you know, I go back to uh, the question you posed to Cynthia for a moment, and, and that is, uh, this is pretty good. You know, the people on that committee are pretty good. Liz Cheney is good. The chair is good. Um, members are good. Um, they're asking the right questions. Their staffers have done a lot of research, uh, probably more research than the FBI has done. I mean, on the top players, right? On the ones who came together in the conspiracy that created the insurrection. We don't care about the people who were out there, you know, doing silly things. We care about the ones who set it up. And, and clearly, how, didn't we know this, that Trump was at the center of it? This is an expression of his, his desire, his misguided desire, his unconstitutional desire to stay in power, no matter what the vote was. You know? um, and, and he kept, look, remember the evidence, he kept looking for ways to do it. You know, this way they said no. That way they said no. This way they said no. They were creative buggeries, what he was. And, and finally, with the, the absence of any other reasonable alternative, uh, let's have an insurrection. Let's take over. Let's march into the Capitol. You know, it's, it's not that they wanted to overturn the election. I want to be clear about this. He wanted to overturn the whole government. He wanted to overturn the United States of America. Uh, it doesn't get any worse than that. If, if there had been someone else trying this and not him, uh, that guy would be mm, uh, in jail now. I don't understand why we can't do that for Trump. So anyway, <clears throat> the, you know, the problem is that we don't see anything happening at the Department of Justice, really. Oh, so they, they raided um, that guy's house. Uh, well, what about the, uh, the house <laughs> raid on uh, Jeffrey Clark, uh, yeah, DOJ? Yeah, it's okay. That's nice, but uh, I'd like to see I'd like to see some real parallel going on here. I'd like to be convinced that uh, Merrick Garland is not AWOL, and so far, I'm sorry, I'm not convinced. And and the problem, you know, that I have is that we have we have a, a deadline. We have the November election coming soon, and in fact, voting is going to start in, within 60 days. So um, is he moving fast enough to even say what he's doing, even if he doesn't do it? He could say, take a position. He can say what, what's going to happen down the line. He's not even saying that. And then furthermore, you have the people around the country. And, you know, if you see those charts about what states have screwed up the voting laws, they're the same states that have, you know, screwed up Roe v. Wade, by the way, same states. You know, there are dozens of states and there are dozens of outrageous laws. And the Supreme Court is in its present uh, adul adulpated condition it's not going to set those laws aside. So we are going to have a judgment day, like it or not, and it's going to be it's going to be an amazing surprise to everybody. It shouldn't be. It's not going to be a surprise to us here um, in November when the Republicans take both houses and do what they bloody well please. Um, and I, you know, so I, I I don't think that Merrick understands the exigencies and the, the need for swift action. And I and, and I, although I think um, you can disagree with me, I, although I think this committee is doing a really terrific job for what they can do, they're limited, you know. 
what they can do. And you know, sadly, they're having trouble getting action on the subpoenas out of Merrick also. Um, they, they may not be reaching enough of the base to make a difference. Well, maybe not be reaching enough of the electorate to make a difference in November. Sorry, well, then it's all a waste, isn't it? Well, let, let me address that. I, I think, you know, earlier I said, you know, the committee has left breadcrumbs for the DOJ. Let's just discuss a few of those breadcrumbs. Well, number one, they're throwing a, showing a clear delineation of the fake elector scheme. That was done masterfully to the House committee hearing. Uh, they've done a great job now just recently about the discussion for Donald Trump to try and attempt to pick up voting machines and use the military to do so. Uh, that's great testimony. Uh, they, again, they did a great job of, 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 of documenting how Donald Trump called the, uh, the Secretary of State in Georgia, Ross and Oates, uh, the, cop, the call to uh, DOJ, again, look past look past things and just put out a statement so that the legislators in all these other states will think that there is some fraudulent activity. And then the, the, try, the attempted to install Jeffrey Clark as the new AG. And then last not least, but we also had other calls to other Secretary of States and Michigan comes to mind. Um, so I think, I think the hearing committee has done a great job of leaving the breadcrumbs for the DOJ to pick up on. I just don't think it's in their, their, their wheelhouse to announce what they're interested in yet. What do you think? They have Jay? great challenges, great challenges, because Trump himself personally, after being warned by Liz Cheney not to tamper with witnesses, he's calling witnesses. <laughs> what a guy. And where is where is Merrick on that one? I mean, that's real time. That's now. It's not even a, an historic uh, examination of what happened. He's doing it now, despite warnings that it is illegal and felonious, as a matter of fact. Um, you know, the, the problem is that you ask me, ask me as a Republican, ask me as a QAnon what I think about this. And I'll tell you, it's a witch hunt. That committee is not doing a good job. Uh, that that committee um, has uh, is 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 uh, is um, is misstating the evidence and they're causing these witnesses to misstate the evidence. And it, this is all anti-Trump. And Trump is still my hero. That's that, you know, that's what they're going to say. A lot of them, uh, they're cultists. And, and this committee may not mean anything to them. You and I and Cynthia and the people we know and, and deal with all day, um, the people we speak to, at least some of them, are totally convinced of what you said. And, you know, they're locked on to that. But not everybody. And remember that truth in this country does not mean what it used to mean. Good point. Uh, Cynthia, you know, after the infamous December 19th, 1, 1.42 a.m. tweet about, you know, come down to the uh, White House, uh, it'll be wild, that, that, that infamous tw tweet, um, what the hearing seemed to put together quite well is that there is a kind of a, a joining of forces between QAnon, the Proud Boys, and the Oath Keepers. Well, once being separate organizations and probably, you know, mistrustful of one another, they decided immediately after that tweet to basically start forming an alliance. And with that alliance, they did gang up and join up uh, for January 6th. Uh, is, that, is that an important fact or is that just an ancillary issue uh, as DOJ looks at this? Well, we saw all the connections in their emails and their social media posts for quite a while now. So um, I think that was really well established all the way through with that sort of line that's been going. Um, we have to remember that that, that, um, that December 19th tweet and meeting and all that stuff <laughs> happened after 60 court cases were lost. And that was something that Good struck point. me when, when Cipollone said that on the, during the, the hearing. And he said, well, I kept trying to tell him, you know, show me your evidence. Where's your evidence? Well, we don't have any. And, and the sort of the way they skirted around trying to answer and, and not just say we don't have evidence or we're working on evidence or, you know, it's like, oh, how can you ask that? And their responses were those kind of dismissive things that showed that they knew what they were doing they knew 100% what they were doing. 
and so did Trump. And I think that's so important. Well, let me go to that point. You know, that's exactly what they asked the uh, Secretary of State of Arizona, Rusty, and I forget his last name. Bowers. Uh, they said, he said, well, that's a major thing you want me to do. Show me the evidence. And, and Giuliani and, and Trump were on that call, that phone call. They were directly involved with that. And they said, oh, we have plenty of it and we'll get to it. We'll show it to you. And we have of course, theories. That's what they said. We have theories. We just don't. We have lots of theories. We just don't have any evidence yet. And I believe. And that he said, "Well, I can't do what you're asking me to do based on you know lack of evidence." <laughs> and so here we are. Donald Trump again in the center of those conversations with various secretaries of state, trying to come up with the either no, more votes or uh, put everything on hold to try to uh, flummox the whole uh, transference of of the president to Joe Biden. Can, 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 can we go back to where you started on this? Uh, and that is uh, um, Liz Cheney's presentation that the, when you say it'll be a wild time, it was a call um, you know, to the Proud Boys. Uh, it was a, a dog whistle um, to them. And um, I use that term because that's a term that came up in the course of the Trump administration many times mm -hmm. where he was speaking to and galvanizing his base and the Proud Boys, and the Oath Keepers, and, and these, these guys with guns. <laughs> he was speaking to them. Um, well, he said, stand, he, stand by, remember that one? Stand by. Stand back he, and yeah, stand by. He has yeah. a line. Now, the question, you know, we have Bates. all, the, the three of us, we have examined the, the, the social, the psychology and the, the social uh, phenomenon involved in Trump, how he can reach people and turn them uh, in his direction, how he, he can call upon their fear. Uh, he can make them into a, a tight community, which he has done. He has, he has created the base. He has galvanized the base over five years, and he still is. And um, the question is whether mm, people, including professionals and psychologists and sociologists, see it the same way that Liz Cheney does. She says this was a dog whistle. She says this was communication to those guys. And they say it is. Mm -hmm. You know, are the professionals convinced? Is the base convinced? Would a jury or a Republican judge be convinced that Trump was actually talking to them? It's still kind of a special question. And it's a kind of an amorphous answer. Well, he just said it'll be a wild time. That's all he said. He didn't say, um, you know, I, I want you to bring weapons. He didn't say that in so many words. And, and of course, you have Michael Cohn saying you have to watch the words he use, uses. It's in the, the you know, the, suggestib the suggestibility of his rhetoric. Um, as Cohn said, rhetoric, it really counts. Rhetoric and dog whistle. Well, as is the witness intimidation issue. Thank you, yes. The yes. way they talk to these witnesses, that Donald Trump's watching, he's reading the transcripts, he still favors you. I mean, these kind of suggestions. Yes. He knows yes. you'll do the right thing. It's mafiosa. It's out of God's it father. Yeah. So. Yeah. Anyway, so I want to make yeah. the point because I it think is. it's not entirely clear that the whole country is going to buy into this thing about the dog whistle. Right. I think we have to not. Good forget point. Well, you've been using dog, dog whistles since he came down the escalator, and not so much a dog whistle. Sometimes a bullhorn, be yeah. it uh, immigration issues, a uh, uh, racism, or 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 in between. So. All righty, uh, we've run out of time. So, uh, Cynthia, what was your takeaway from the hearing here on Tuesday? Well, I think we need Love to comments. not forget about old Mike Flynn um, calling, you know, for martial law every five minutes, calling for martial law. Um, even in that meeting, as you know, we we'd never had proof or, I guess, corroboration that he said those things. But now we do after this hearing, because Cipollone told us that he was saying it in the meeting, and so was, um, and so was what's her name, the crazy lawyer lady. Um, sorry, I was I have a mental block. Sydney, Sydney Powell. Powell. Thank you. Yeah, Sydney Powell. Um, so they were, you know, calling for that night. They were calling for martial law after they knew they'd already exhausted all the courts the possible courts, right? So now what's next? That meeting was uh, 
sort of a tipping point of what are we going to do next? And they were just sort of fomenting all these crazy ideas of martial law, get all the voting machines, you know, all these different things that they're going to try to do. Let's not forget that when uh, Senator Murphy, no, Congresswoman Murphy, excuse me, um, was giving her closing and when she was talking about it, she listed every single one of the other people that were there and involved in all of this, Jim Jordan, Mo Brooks, um, I didn't write down all the names. There was like six of them. And so I think that's what I want people to go out and look at. Because here we've been focused, focused, focused on pinning this on Trump without really even mentioning any of these, you know, totally crooked, corrupt um, congressmen that were involved. Bobert was one of them. Uh, Matt Gates was one of them. Mm -hmm. And even Marjorie Taylor Greene was one of them. All of these people that were involved in a meeting together about this very thing um, and, and how, so they knew about January 6th too. It wasn't a surprise to them when it happened. They had right. already been involved in some of the meetings beforehand. So I want to see a start to really hold these um, congressmen and women um, also guilty, right? And, and also corrupt and complicit in all this. And not just quietly, oh, they didn't do anything, so they were complicit. No, they were involved. Right. And I think we need to have way more hearings so that we can flush out all of that stuff. Because I don't believe we can trust Merrick Garland to really do it. He right. is so tied to his federalist roots. And we have to always remember that's where um, Merrick Garland comes from. That, you know, ultra conservative uh, believes that the president should have all power, things like that. that's where his mentality is. And he would have made a great Supreme Court judge. But I think that. No, he, no, no. Sorry. Terrible. You don't think <laughs> well, we won't have time now? to debate that point. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think he might have made because he's really into the law and all that. But yeah, I understand. But he's. But he's, he's a terrible, terrible. Um, he's hopeless. Attorney that's what I'm general. Saying. So that's all, my thought. All right, Cynthia. Thanks <laughs> for your points. And I think, unfortunately, your point's well made about the Congress uh, men that might have been involved. But there's only one hearing left, probably, maybe, maybe two. But they're not going to get to it, unfortunately. So your your wish may go unanswered, but we'll see. Uh, Jay, your last takeaway of the hearing uh, before we uh, end today. Well, you know they have done a good job, and, and nobody will nobody I know will dispute that. Um, but as I mentioned before, you know the question is whether it reaches the, the base, the public, the country at large, and that's a big question, and I'm pessimistic about it. However. And this is something I would like to talk about on American Issues Take Two tomorrow, is the media. How well is the media done in covering these hearings? And how well can the media do now in making the points that you guys, that all of us have been making about the efficacy of these, of these proceedings and what we have learned in these proceedings, what we have found about these characters, the inmates who are running the asylum here. Um, and you know, I think we have really got to have that permeate the entire country between now and even September. Every day counts. So we should talk about this tomorrow in terms of the role of the media in making it clear what has happened. All righty, Jay, look forward to that conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, we've run out of time. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and I sincerely would like to thank Jay Fidel and Cynthia Lee Sinclair. Thank you one and all. Thank you for your great comments. And we'll see you next week. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii.
If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.